Mr. Speaker, if you think about it, this motion actually gives us very little clues about the kinds of groups that we're dealing with, except for one thing, that they reached out to international organizations, usually in the West, for help. So all of the kinds of speculations about the incentives and the behaviors of these groups are premised on an understanding about the nature of those groups and the circumstances in which they find themselves. The importance of the clue that they reached out to international organizations, given all of the reasons we hear from government that it is against their incentives to do so, suggests that these groups are weak, that perhaps they are on their death throes, that only when these groups are at their most vulnerable do they have an incentive to reach out at all. All of the teams thus far have missed the comparative. We don't have this kind of epistemic uncertainty about whether these groups will continue or not. The only groups that will reach out to international organizations are those that are weakened. Two arguments in this speech in extension. First, I'm going to explain why this sustains groups that would otherwise most probably fail. Second, I'm going to extend material about the nature of human humanitarian groups. First, why are these, in almost all instances, going to be the most vulnerable groups? First of all, because they're doing things like taking part in kidnapping. Opening government tries to say that this isn't the group they want to talk about. But it is the most likely group that will reach out. So they can't say no if they want to benefit like, access all their benefits. The reasons why we know this are most groups don't have the resources to carry out effective sieges over the long term. Even those groups that do often start out with individual and particularistic strategies like, like kidnapping. The fact that they go to international organizations who don't have that much money to go to, when after the US government has already likely said no to those groups, the fact that these groups are engaging in isolated incidents rather than an overall strategy and engaging in things like kidnapping suggests that they're weak. So the kinds of groups they must deal with in this debate are groups like M8, Boko Haram, and Somali pirates who form the vast majority of the people who are likely to reach out. But second of all, in the cases of sieges, right, they give us the best, best possible reason to believe that these sieges are unlikely to last going into the future. They themselves say that they require civilian support. The fact that people are dying of cholera suggests that that siege is unlikely to last when they no longer have the legitimacy of their own people. So all of the material Tash gives us about the role that starvation plays suggests that those regimes are unlikely to last. Moreover, we know this, right, because it is against every incentive to reach out to the West whom by their own concession they distrust. When Hezbollah starts reaching out to the West, you know that they are on the last possible steps, right? Even uh, quickly, in response to the idea that people can escape, right? That is vastly against the characterization that we get from opening government. That the point of these organizations is that they want to establish a long-term and stable presence. The fact that that is no longer a viable alternative is the only reason why they would turn to international organizations. Given that, why does the comparative suddenly become clearer? Because the choice becomes sustaining organizations that would otherwise fail versus ones that would otherwise continue. The comparison that opening gives us is a good one. They say that these groups are unlikely to continue on things like sieges and instead, oh no, go toward things like diamond mines and other economic projects. Why is that better? Four reasons. First is a reason that Tasha provides. That is an incredibly time-consuming process. The benefit of that is that the state is able to intervene, the state is able to respond more quickly. But second of all, many organizations simply don't have the capacity to do things like take over diamond mines that leaves them out. Finally, it removes the ideological component of the kind of attack they take out. That ISIS is able to succeed and what they get out of kidnapping is that they cause terror from those actions that's incentivized under their side. Moreover, I recognize that all of the good arguments that OO gives about how this improves legitimacy and how this improves funding for those organizations only makes sense given the context that these organizations are likely to fail. In their next speech, they need to deal with that characterization because that has been well missing from this debate. No thank you. Finally, on this question about the impact that this has on the group, let's talk about moderation. 
because despite its like aspirational title of the kinds of things he wants to address in his extension, it was insufficiently justified. One of the most important reasons they give is that the West is seen as a good actor within those areas. If those organizations felt that it was a threat to their legitimacy, which is what Pat tells us, right? They're unlikely to show off the role that the West does. So they're likely to try and do things like keep it secret, for instance. We agree with OO, that's unlikely to succeed, but that's the kind of thing they do. But second of all, the very worst organizations aren't reaching out to the West at all. That is to say that if they are ideologically opposed to the West, ideologically opposed to these institutions, those aren't the kinds of groups that are going to moderate in the first instance. What does this do for human humanitarianism, right? We're going to say an ad to, uh, to CG material. Given that by and large, we think, given that we're not talking Last about time. the US government, for instance, this is uh, something you know for so. Yeah. So, as the Donut School has just shown, all groups want funding because funding is their objective, right? Tasha asked you, for example, where it is not obvious to an aid group that this group is weakening and that they shouldn't provide it. You still have it, and even if it were the case that they're weakening, we gave you analysis that they'll seek out more radical sources. So given that I've given you reasons to believe why the most likely instance is that all of these groups who reach out for funding are by and large weakening, whenever they err, i.e. Pat, whenever they implement the model you proposed before this house, they will have erred in their judgment and they will fail, right? So second, what does this do for humanity, humanitarianism? It increases local distrust within those regimes, right? That, the, that Cambodia still continues to distrust the West, for instance, and that's an example that they provide. We think it leads to local distrust and reduces their efficacy in carrying those things out. Second, you reduce the, your, your association and your work with governments like the United States who say that we won't work with organizations who negotiate with terrorists, right? Given that that is a major funding for them, that goes down. Finally, the people who form some kind of expertise who are opposed to those oppressive groups are unlikely to help out. It's not always about money. We think those experts are unlikely to help. The most important question in this debate is the nature of the groups we're talking about. We gave you the most convincing characterization of that. We're proud to oppose.